This is a message from the ministry of Westfield Baptist Church. For more information about our church, please visit westfieldbaptistchurch.org. Well, my heart has been blessed beyond measure already, and I suspect that it's only getting better from here. This is the portion of our service where we study God's Word, and we give it a solemn sacredness. Because it is during this part of our service that we hear from God. This morning we'll be studying Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, if you'd like to make your way there. And as you do, I am going to pray for our time together. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we love you, Lord. We love you. That's why we're here this morning and we're not sleeping in or doing whatever it is that most people in the world are doing. Lord, we have entered into your courts with thanksgiving and with praise, with song and with testimony, with prayer, Lord, and gladness in our hearts. And we desire, God, to hear from you. Would you speak to us a word this morning, a true word, a needy word, a word of your saving grace found in the gospel of Jesus Christ? May you not only tell it to us, but may you Compel our hearts to adore in it. May we be drawn, Lord, to the risen Jesus Christ. May he be afresh and anew, the apple of our heart, our eye, and our heart's greatest treasure. Do this, Lord, for your namesake. We pray it in in the name of Christ. Amen. All righty. Well... We heard from my mom, let me just tell you that in 2006, when I was 18 years of age, this intertwines a little bit with her story, I too was converted. I was converted, and with my conversion, I experienced great change. I began to grow disinterested in my sin. It was less appealing to me, and the God of whom I had been disinterested in my entire life, had paid him very little mind, slowly but surely was becoming the love of my life. I sinned less and less. I loved God more and more. I began to attend church. I was eventually baptized. My whole life changed. My entire life changed. But I think we would say that not everyone who is converted or, well, everyone who claims to have been converted, experiences change, do they? How many, I wonder, in this room alone have a son or daughter, a grandson or granddaughter, a brother or sister, a mother or father, who at one point in their life, they professed faith. They did all things right. They did what they were supposed to do. They stood up. They walked forward. They might have even knelt before this very altar. And they prayed and asked Jesus to enter into their heart. They accepted him as their Lord and Savior. And they seemed to do it with great sincerity. And yet, where are they now? Where are they today? At the end of it all, after the dust has settled, they didn't actually change. It wasn't a change that lasted. There was no true conversion. We're not the only church to experience this phenomenon, by the way. In 2019, Lifeway produced a study that showed that two-thirds, that's startling to me, two-thirds, two out of every three Protestants, that once had attended church with regularity, and all they mean by regularity in this study, by the way, is at least once a month, okay? So two-thirds of people that were attending church once a month have since stopped attending. They were here. They were regular. They were faithful for a time. And now they are not. What's up with that? What's going on? Friends, we must be so very careful in how and to whom we pronounce saved. 
How do you know that someone has been saved? Or perhaps even a more fundamental question, how does one become saved? How do they get saved in the first place? What do you do? A church that answers these questions wrongly is a church that will have an unhealthy and even harmful view of conversion. But that is not the church that we want to be. We want to be a good church, a church that thinks rightly about conversion, biblical conversion, a theology of conversion taken right from these pages. A good church is a church that believes what God says and obeys what God commands. A good church is a church that understands conversion to be God's doing. He does it, every bit of it. And a good church knows that true conversion is always, 100% of the time, marked by real, lasting change. I'd like to approach our text today by way of three questions all of which you'll find in the handout inside of your bulletin. And my first question is this. Do we need to change? Do we need to change? If conversion can be thought of as change, is that something we even need? Do we need to be converted? Now let me just say that not everyone answers yes to that question, do they? Nah. I'm good. I think I'm a pretty good person as I am. Nah, I don't need to change. My life is good just how it is. Well, such a person has clearly never read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And if they were to read verse 1 alone, they would see that outside of Christ, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Dead, not breathing, no heartbeat. Dead, and yet even as dead men, we once walked. Listen closely now as I read the text. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning of verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus Four good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. So where were we? Dead men, dead women, walking. I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase before, maybe in an old western. That's a dead man walking. What does that mean? They've been marked for death. They've as good as received the death sentence. There is no chance that they are making it out of here. They are destined for death. And indeed, we were destined for death. Dead men walking. And as we walked in our trespasses and sins, we did so in lockstep with our master, who, according to verse 2, is called the prince of the power of of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And so he is a spiritual being. And who is he, the prince of the power of the air? He is Satan, the great deceiver. And like the pied piper, he plays his flute and we march along in rhythm straight towards the gates 
of hell. A little dishonesty here, a little lust there, a little blasphemy here, a little self-worship there. And he just marches us all the way, start to finish, birth to death, earth to hell. And so we were, beloved. So we were. And not just us, but what does the text say? All of mankind. All of mankind. In verse 3, among whom we once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. By our very nature, every one of us, 10 out of 10, Anyone that has ever walked this earth apart from Jesus Christ, a child of wrath. And therefore, a dead man walking, destined for wrath, following Satan to our doom. Drinking down sin like it were a cold glass of water on a hot day. And so I ask again, do we need to change? Well, yes, we must. If you don't want to go to hell, then you better change. Well, how do we change then? How can we change? I don't know. What would you say? How is one converted? Well, you've got to give it all to God. Well, you've got to ask Jesus to come into your heart. Well, you've got to pray and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you have to really mean it. But friends... Didn't our sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters and brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers, didn't many of them do that very thing? And wasn't there a time in which they meant it, at least then, with great sincerity? So why didn't we see lasting change in them? But we did see it in us. Why didn't their conversion take? How can we be converted? How is one saved? Or as a wealthy young man once once asked the Lord Jesus Christ, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, look with me in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, and we'll begin to, I think, see our answer. It says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. I don't know if you caught that. But God made us alive together with Christ. But God, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. How are we converted? How are we saved? God, God does it. The only thing that you and I contribute to our salvation is what? It is our sin. Even our faith, even our very believing and taking hold of the gift of salvation, even that is granted to us. We see that in verse 8. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Friends, even our believing, God does that for us as well. He awakens us to faith. It is all of Him. It is all from Him. Grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Now, pastor, one might rebuttal. Mankind has a will, does he not? We might be drowning But when Jesus throws us the life raft of salvation, we still have to exercise our free will and make that decision for ourselves and take hold of that raft. You might might be drowning, but you still have to do your part. You have to reach out by faith and take hold of the gift. And I would simply respond by saying this. Friend, you weren't drowning. You were drowned. Dead in your trespasses and sins. Following the prince of the power of the air. Who is at work among the sons or the sons of disobedience. 
How does a dead man take hold of a raft? Answer, he doesn't. If you are here today, saved and secured in Christ, it is simply because Christ chose to save you. No other reason. He himself dove into the deep waters and he pulled you out even at the cost of his own life. He did it all start to finish. Salvation is the work of God and God alone. And so why does God save? What does the text say? What compelled Christ to dive into the icy depths after sinners such as you and I? What was his motivation? Verse 4 says, But God being Rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. That's his motivation. He loves us. He saved us because he loves us. Not because we earned it. Not because we're useful to him. Not because of our potential. But because he is rich in mercy. And he has loved us with great love even when we were dead in our trespasses. And how does God save? What was the means that he used to bring about our conversion? Verse 5 says, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated, and he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Friends, the means by which we are saved is not something That we do. It's not any action or any prayer or anything on our part. It was and is exclusively due to action on God's part. 2,000 years ago, Jesus died for sinners, securing salvation for his people. Those that are his. They were buried with Christ. We're going to see that in a moment in baptism. They were buried with him. They were with Christ put to death, death even on a cross. And Jesus, yes, he died. And just as our defeat was his defeat, his victory is now our victory. When Jesus rose, we rose with him. In Jesus and with Jesus, we were made alive. Don't you just feel it? My believing brother or sister. Don't you just feel it? Life. Divine given life. Pumping through these veins. True conversion. True change. Change has been brought to this sinner. I am finally alive. And I was made alive by Jesus. And his substitutionary death on the cross and his substitutionary resurrection in my place. And why did Jesus do all of that? To what end did God save me? What was his purpose or mission in coming and living and dying and rising in my stead? Verse 7 says, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. What? What? What grace? What love? What joy? God's love for me motivated him to come and die in my place so that he can what? So that he can love me more. So that he can keep loving me. So that he can show me just how much he loves me. So that we might see with our eyes how truly immeasurable is his grace and kindness Towards us in Christ Jesus. What sort of God is this that lays down his life for monsters and worms like us, dead people, sinners, enemies of God, children of Satan? I don't have good words for you, beloved. This goes beyond my capacity to to describe to you just how great this God is. He is good beyond description. He is love beyond measure. He is great beyond knowing. And when he saves someone, he really saves them. They're not just converted. They are changed. Death to life. 
darkness to light, born again, a new creature. Verse 10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I'd like you to notice several parallels between verses 1 and 3 and verse 10 that I think are worth noting. First of all, in verses 1 and 2, we were walking in what? We were walking in our trespasses and our sins. But here in verse 10, because of what God has done, we are to walk in good works. Secondly, in our walking, previously, who was it that was at work in us? It was the prince of the power of the air. It was Satan who was at work in the sons of disobedience. But now, post-conversion, we are the workmanship of God. We are His creation, created for good works. Prior to salvation, what was the marker of someone's lostness? What was it that marked one as the workmanship of Satan? Well, it was how they walked. And what is it now that we use to identify those who are truly in Christ? Well, according to verse 10, it is how they walk. We know genuine conversion by the way that one walks. Do they continue to walk in their sin? Or have they since been transformed and worked out by God and are now walking in the good works that he prepared for them? Friends, when we have someone that claims to be converted and their life doesn't change, I think what we're actually saying is that God is not a very good craftsman. If they are his workmanship, then he must not be good, that good at what he's doing. And he's just incapable of changing them. Friends, the evidence of true conversion is change. Good works. You will know a tree by its fruits, Jesus said. And this sounds basic. But in reality, so many get this wrong. It has been a plague on the modern church. And because people get this wrong, our churches are often filled with unconverted people. So many treat the sincerity of their profession of faith as if that is the evidence of salvation. Pastors will often even encourage people, listen now, you came forward, you prayed today, you write the date in the back of your Bible. And when Satan comes knocking on your door and says you're not saved, you just flip your Bible open and you show him because you've got it written in ink. As if that was the determining factor of your being saved or not because of something you did 20 years ago in a time of emotion. You might have meant it then, but do you mean it today? Well, let's bring it a little closer to home. How many of us have had those dear loved ones or friends that at one point or another, they did make a profession of faith and they seemed sincere. They walked well for a time, but they have since turned away and are showing no signs of coming back. They've lost their way, we tell ourselves. But he or she is a good kid. They'll be back. Maybe. Or maybe they're lost. Maybe it's time that we were honest with them and even honest with ourselves to continue to walk in trespasses and sins is to walk in the footsteps of Satan. Maybe it's time that we get on our knees and plead, God, save them. Lord, have mercy. Maybe it's time that we, in a tactful, patient, loving, and yet serious and pointed way, Go to them and we have a conversation with our wayward family and friends. Because we love them so much, do we not? Shouldn't we at least be honest with them? Shouldn't we be honest with ourselves even? 
Because the only thing worse than being dead in your trespasses and sins is being dead in your trespasses and sins on the way to hell, but thinking that you have secured your ticket to heaven. In 1985, you would have been hard-pressed to find a football team as good or a fan base as proud as the people of Washington, D.C., home of the Washington Redskins. The Redskins had gone to the Super Bowl just the year before, and they had won the Super Bowl. I'm sorry, they had gone to the Super Bowl just the year before, and they had won the Super Bowl the year before that. And fandom for the hometown team was at an all-time high. 149 consecutive games, RFK Stadium had sold out. And to get season tickets to the Redskins game that year, there was a 25-year waiting list. And so you can imagine the excitement that over 100 citizens of the District of Columbia must have felt when they woke up one crisp fall morning to find free tickets to the Bengals-Redskins game. They were to arrive at the Washington Convention Center on December the 15th, the day of the big game, and they would receive not one, but two, one for themselves and their plus one. And then they would be bussed from the convention center straight to the stadium, all for free. And so, of course, they came. 119 of them, in fact, elated and ready to enjoy their big day. Finally, a little bit of luck. Finally, their big break. And so they were ushered in into the convention center with laughs and smiles, mascots and cheerleaders. They went through the identification process. They presented their ID to make sure that they were who they said they were. And then they were sent to the grand ballroom for the official giving away of the tickets. Now, there was only one catch This, in reality, wasn't a giveaway, but a sting operation. You see, each lucky winner was a wanted criminal. And all the mascots, cheerleaders, help staff, they were, in fact, U.S. Marshals. And so these felons were corralled into a single room, all seated, all smiles. They were hugged and high-fived and congratulated All the way there, they received then, in a moment that was truly made for TV, their tickets. And Louis McKinney, a U.S. Marshal who was playing Master of Ceremonies, then said to them, he announces through the loudspeaker, Well, everybody, we are so glad that you are here. And do we have a big surprise for you? I'm not making this up. You're all under arrest. And at that moment, stormed in the SWAT team. Doors from every side flew open. And 119 criminals were cuffed and taken straight to jail. They thought that they had received a ticket to the big game. But they really had received a ticket to a cell. Let me tell you another true story, church. It's even more tragic. There are countless criminals walking around this globe today who believe that they have their ticket to heaven. They did the thing. They walked the aisle. They prayed the prayer. And just like those criminals at the Washington Convention Center in 1985, they were high-fived and congratulated and hugged. I'm so proud of you for making this decision. I'm just so happy that you decided to give your life to Jesus. But in reality, these are individuals that aren't on their way to heaven or to the big game or anywhere good. On that day, boy, is there a surprise in store for them. For the only ticket that they have is a ticket straight to hell. For they are criminals, perpetrators, sons of disobedience, children of wrath. The evidence of real conversion is real change, not a profession of faith. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. There's a profession of faith. 
but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. There's the change. You know, sometimes I think we act as if God needs a helping hand. Pastors especially. I think we act sometimes if, as if we're God's wingman, you know? I got your back, God. And so during a time of invitation, all of a sudden, they convert no, no longer merely in preachers, but into prophets. And during the, the invitation, they look and make eye contact with the pianist. One more. One more time through. Because I know that there's one here that's holding out. One here that needs to save. And so they speak, come on now. Do it today. Do what? What is it that we do? Do we save ourselves? Does our salvation rest upon a magic, magic formula or even our own sincerity? And you know, sometimes we even treat the gospel as if it were a medicine that needs to be tucked away into a little treat, like we're trying to sneak it to our dog. Listen, God can heal your marriage. He can fix your finances. He can heal your body. You've just got to trust in Him. Give it all to Him. Look, all you have to do is close your eyes, repeat after me, and really mean it. Really mean it. Say it from your heart, and it's that easy. Where is that in the Bible? Really? Here's what I see in the Bible. A rich young man comes before Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replies... Sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. And the man leaves sorrowful for he had many possessions. Did Jesus just mess up? Someone should have taught Jesus the Romans road. A scribe comes to Jesus and says, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay, your head, lay his head. And guess what? Neither will you. Another one of his disciples comes to him and says, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus says, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Come with me and die. Jesus says. Are you willing to go die with Christ? But can't you just see it, my friends? <laughs> that if you go and lose your life for Jesus, you find it. And you find it forever and ever, for ages and ages and all of eternity, God will show to you the immeasurable riches of of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For those in whom the Lord has worked a true miracle of regeneration, the cry of their heart is always a resounding, Yes, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And it is they who say, along with the missionary Jim Elliot, who died a martyr's death for Jesus' sake, He is no fool who gives what He cannot keep to gain which he, that which He cannot lose. One final comment as we close. I've spent most of our time today talking about conversion is something that God does. Not us, not by our praying or our asking or our seeking. God does it. And so you might say, okay, I've got it. I don't take hold of the wrath. Jesus takes hold of me after he dies into the depths after me. But, and this is the question that I think I would ask, if I were a non-Christian listen, listening on today, I would ask this. Well, what does that mean for me? Am I supposed to just sit around and wait for God to tug at my heartstrings? If I feel conviction, good, then God is doing it. If I don't, well, then I can't do anything about it anyways. It's on God. There's nothing for me to do. Friend, look, we do come to God. We do repent of our sins. We, we do turn away from our former walk of life, our sins, our trespasses, our former master, even Satan. And we do turn to God. We reach for Him by faith. We cling to Him. We cry out. We ask for forgiveness and salvation. And we believe upon the gospel with our whole 
hard. And for some people, that looks like walking up here and kneeling before an altar. For others, it might look like a sinner's prayer. For you, it might be nothing more than a prayer of desperation. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Even from right there, where you're sitting today, even as I preach. Do what you must. Cry, plead, beg, mourn, run, repent. Whatever is necessary, turn to the Lord. If you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. Turn to Him and be saved. But let me be clear. When we repent of our sins and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance and faith, even then when we believe, repentance and faith isn't a work. This is what it is. This is what repentance and faith is. <gasps> it is drawing breath. Jesus lifts you above the water. You were dead beneath the depths. And Christ went in after you. And when you say, Lord, save me, I believe. Christ has made you alive. He has granted you faith. He has done a work. He has lifted your head above the water. He has given you a new heart. A new heart that finally says, I love the Lord. I hate my sin. I don't want that anymore. I want Christ. I'm moving towards Christ. I'm praying to Christ. I'm calling on Christ. Christ, would you save me? Sin becomes abhorrent and unappealing. And you run to Jesus. You were previously by nature a child of wrath, but now by your very nature you are one who runs to Jesus. You are the workmanship of God. You were made to do this. You were remade to do this, to run to Him, to cry out to Him, to plead, save me. Your heart is beating. Your lungs are expanding. You're drawing breath. And that is why, church, that we do not have to twist someone's arm or emotionally manipulate them into being saved. If God is truly drawing someone, let me just tell you, he has a 100% success rate in his rescue missions. And a good church knows that. A good church knows that conversion is 100% God's doing. A good church knows that the gospel is an appeal that we need to tuck into a tree and sneak into someone. But it is a treasure of infinite value worth trading our lives for. A good church knows that true salvation, true conversion, is always 100% of the time marked by real, lasting change. Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you now and we thank you, Lord, that you did not leave us as we were, dead in our trespasses, dead in our sins, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who is at work in the sons of disobedience. Lord, we were children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. But, but you, God, not prompted by anything good in us, you chose to plunge beneath the icy waters and come and rescue dead sinners. Thank you, Lord, that you have now lifted those that believe above water. And we breathe, we turn to you in faith. We turn to you in repentance. And we do cry out, Lord, save us. And keep saving us. Save us on the last day. And we know, Lord, even by the marker of a changed life, that we have been saved. And we have confidence that on that final day when we stand before you, 
you will forgive us for what we have done, for you have done away with your wrath for all of our wicked deeds in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for this good, glorious gospel. Friends, let's keep our heads bowed. You know, this is not something that I do often. But I think today is an appropriate day for it. It would not be surprising to me for there to be at least some, even in this room, that have professed faith, but they are yet to see any real change in their life. But you want it. You want it. You want to know Christ. You want to love him more faithfully than you love him today. Cherish him more deeply than you cherish him today. And you want to turn away from your sin. And you're just not sure. I just don't know if I'm in Christ or not. Because my life hasn't changed. Friend, if that is you. And you would like me to pray for you. And you would like me to at some point in the next week reach out to you and just have some sort of conversation about how we can be saved or how we can know if we are saved. If that is you, would you raise your hand? Heads remain bowed, please. Thank you. Thank you. Friends, in just a moment, we're going to stand and sing and respond to the Lord. But I think it is fitting to have a time of meditation and personal prayer with your Lord. And so I'm going to stop praying, but you're going to keep praying. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, and you work out your salvation in fear and trembling with the Lord. Some of you have great calls for rejoicing because you know who you once were. And you are not that person any longer. And that could only have been God's doing. And so you praise Him. And for others, maybe this is a time in which you need to plead before the Lord, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Whatever the case, this is a time for you now. Pray before your Lord. And afterwards, Amber will lead us and ask you to stand to sing. Let's pray.